we've been studying the fifth book of the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostles, which some have suggested ought to be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, as God brings His mighty works to men through the leadership of the Apostles in the book of Acts. We saw that the key verse, and we, we studied Acts 1 and Acts 2 in some detail, we studied Acts 3 and Acts 4 much more quickly as a kind of overview. And we saw that the key book and the key verse in the book of Acts was Acts 1 6, one of the last things which Jesus says before he ascends to be with the Father. And this happened 40 days after his resurrection. Jesus said, um, You shall receive power. The book of Acts is, is a book about power, God's power unleashed among men and through men. In the Gospels, the people watched what Jesus did, the great power and the, and the healing and the mighty acts which came through Him. In the book of Acts, the people witnessed the mighty acts which came to men and then through them led by the ministry of the apostles. Acts 1-6 is the question that they ask. Acts 1-8 is the answer. Strike that. Acts 1-8 is the key. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So, Acts 1-8 not only talks about the great subject of this book, but it talks about the locale, the, the site. And we, we mentioned more than once that we see in Acts 1-8 uh, really an outline of the whole book of Acts. Because in Acts 1 through 7, we see the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea, spreading out from the center in Jerusalem like this. Jerusalem, Judea, Acts 8, Samaria, Acts 9 through 28, the uttermost part of the earth. And we see that progression. Right now we're in the middle of our study uh, of what happens in Jerusalem. And we ask ourselves the question, um, can't someone make the argument, why do you want to go somewhere else and witness? There's so much work to be done here. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up near Atlanta, Georgia. If I waited until the work was done in Atlanta, Georgia, I wouldn't be in Kursk today. Because there's much work to be done in Atlanta, Georgia, still, much, much work. Just as there's much work to be done in Jerusalem, if the apostles had waited until all the work was done in Jerusalem, the gospel would have never reached the whole world because Jerusalem and Israel, the people who live there are among the most resistant to the gospel for 2,000 years. So it's not that we finish the work before we move on. We share the truth and we keep moving. Now that doesn't mean that God won't call many of you to stay and to work and to witness in the places where, you're, where you grow up. But you know, the choice is not between um, going or staying. That's not the choice for a Christian. The choice for a Christian is between going or sending. We either go ourselves or we send others and we support and encourage and pray for them. We commission them, we send them out, and then we help them. And this is the pattern and the progression that we see in the book of Acts. In Acts 1, the mighty event is the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ going up, received into the heavens, to be enthroned at the right hand of the Father. In Acts 2, the great event is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, there are different emblems, different symbols of the Holy Spirit. Oil is an emblem of the Holy Spirit as in an anointing. Oil was a symbol of power being poured on somebody. And so the Holy Spirit is poured out like an anointing oil to bring power. A dove is the 
symbol of the Holy Spirit, the gentleness of the Holy Spirit, come to bring peace and to offer peace from God. Fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit descending on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 with a mighty uh, rushing wind and with fire. It was a tremendous miracle, and Peter explained the miracle through his great sermon on the day of Pentecost and showed how these things fulfilled exactly what Jesus prophesied. Peter says in Acts 2.33 that God has poured forth His Spirit, which they would see and hear. The whole point is to give witness to the truth of what Jesus did. Now, we talked in chapter 3 about the healing of a lame man, and the significant thing about that is that this was a lame man whom everybody knew. He, he had his station at a prominent place so that the go, those going into the temple always saw him. Everyone who ever went to the temple knew that this man was crippled, knew that this man would not get up, could not get up. And so when he was healed, they knew that a mighty power, a liberating power, a healing power, had visited Jerusalem in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one could deny it. We ask ourselves the question, um, why isn't everybody healed? Well, we are being invited to a place where everyone will be healed. That place is heaven. God will bring, their in, bring us there in His own time, and God will bring us there on His own terms. Jesus healed all who came to Him, but Jesus didn't heal everyone in the world. There were lepers who were left. There were graves which were still full when Jesus finished His ministry. The point is not to bring relief to everybody. The point is to prove that these messengers bring with them the power of God because they bring with them the truth of God. How do you know that they're really telling the truth of God? Because they bring with them the power of God to prove that they are different from other men. This is what happens in Acts chapter 3 when the lame man is healed in chapter 3, 1 through 11. And then, of course, Peter interprets the miracle. The miracle is to bring a message. The miracle is not just a show of power. It's not a way to show off. The miracle is not just to relieve the sufferer. The miracle is given to call attention to the message. That happened on the day of Pentecost. That happens in Jerusalem with the healing of the, of the lame man. And Peter brings a caption, an explanation for the picture in chapter 3. Um, and the message for the people is a message of repentance. Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He might send Jesus the Christ appointed to you. What is repentance? Repentance is a change. It's a turning. And we see the theme again at the end of chapter 3. God raised up His servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Now, instead of repenting, the Jewish leaders began to persecute the, the disciples, uh, the apostles. Remember the difference between a disciple and an apostle. A disciple comes near to learn. An apostle goes out to teach. An apostle is an equipped and commissioned disciple. The Greek word for disciple means learner. The Greek word for apostle means one who is sent out with authority. And so we could also outline the book of Acts this way. Um, Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down, and the apostles went out. And when they went out, they encountered persecution. They encountered resistance. You know, one of the greatest reasons that people don't come to Christ is because they know something of people who are supposed to be Christians. And so very often I talk to unbelievers who don't want to become a Christian because they see some contradiction, some hypocrisy, some sin, some 
disappointment in the life of someone who's supposed to be a Christian? And the answer I always give to a person like that is, this is exactly the way it was in the Bible. This doesn't prove that Christianity is not true. This proves that Christianity is true. It was the religious people who killed Jesus. The political representative, Pontius Pilate, only wanted to beat Jesus up. It was the priests, the religious representatives, who insisted that he be crucified. And in chapter 4, it's the priests who are leading the resistance to Jesus. They didn't believe in him. They crucified him. But now they see great and mighty works done in his name in their city, the city that they rule, the city that they had control of by Roman permission. And so what do they do? They persecute the apostles. And Peter answers them in chapter 4, verse 8. This was the passage we were, we were looking at um, when we finished the last time. But Peter's conclusion is this. Um, Acts 4, verse 20, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. And if any man or woman has a real experience of Jesus Christ, that man or woman cannot stop speaking about what he knows of Jesus. Jesus changes us once we meet him. And Jesus, when we meet him, makes himself important enough to the point where he becomes the subject of our conversation. He becomes the passion of our future, even if it costs us something, as indeed it costs the, the apostles something. Um, there is a great combination of God's sovereignty and human effort in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter talks about in verse 28, that God has done whatever His hand and purpose has predestined to occur. And yet He does it through weak human beings like you and me. God's predestination does not function outside the realm of human effort. God does give decrees, but those decrees are so comprehensive and so all-encompassing that they include the reality of human decisions, your decision and my decision, which makes a big difference about what happens for the cause of God in the world. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Peter prays in verse 29 about the threats. Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence that you would extend your hand to heal. Signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Uh, and it said that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak the word of God with boldness. Um, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is present? We know the Holy Spirit is present when the Word of God is spoken with boldness against opposition. One of the great confirmations of the truth of this Word is the fact that it's so opposed. Um, the Gospel is opposed throughout the Mideast. The gospel is opposed in North Korea. The gospel is opposed where secular people want to have control. Why? Because it's powerful and because it changes the lives of people. If it didn't have the potential to change the life of someone, then no one would oppose it. So the gospel is not only proven by those who accept it, the authenticity of the gospel is also demonstrated by the fact that it is so viciously opposed. And I will just tell you this, one of the great proofs that the Bible is true is the opposition to the Jews, the fact that the Jews are hated, and the fact that the Jews 
are spoken against throughout the world, even in the 21st century. It's an amazing phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon that we see in Holy Scripture. We see it in the book of Esther. We see it in other places. It's still going on. It's still going on in the place where Esther lived, ancient Persia, modern-day Iran. Well, we ended chapter 4 by being introduced to a, an important personality in the book of Acts, someone whose name was Joseph from Cyprus, but he was given a name to describe his ministry. He was given the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And Barnabas was so, so committed to the Lord that he sold his property and he gave all his money to the church and he made himself available to the church. That's the last thing we see in chapter 4. We'd already noted the fact, as you look at chapter 4, verse 32, uh, and this sounds a little bit funny for a Christian to say, but the Christians in Jerusalem lived in a kind of communist society. Now, we always associate communism with something opposed to Christianity. Communism is a wonderful thing as long as it's voluntary and as long as it's based on love. The family is a communist unit. Communism becomes wicked when someone makes you give up your property and takes it away from you. If you give your property willingly and you share out of love, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that's what was happening in the church at Jerusalem. Acts 4.32, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. That was the original situation in Jerusalem. As far as we know, no other church had that arrangement. But that was the original arrangement in Jerusalem. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150 or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.